Hi everyone, Julie here. Um, glad to see all of you. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Julie Schmidt, host uh, for this room and club. Uh, just as we get started, a few clubhouse pointers. Um, if everyone could use a little plus sign at the bottom, between others you think might be interested in the conversation into the room, um, you can use the uh, little search button, um, or, sorry, the search, search bar to uh, narrow down search words like clinical trials or research for people that you think might be interested in this room specifically. If that word is in their bio, then they'll pop up. Um, and Clubhouse will limit you to the number of people you can ping. So, um, be sure to follow myself, all of our moderators, the panelists, co hosts here today, um, and check out everyone's bios that you might want to uh, connect with. Um, any new Clubhouse members or individuals with little party hats next to their names, uh, you might want to follow them to encourage their journey here in Clubhouse. Um, we Love to hear from people, so please raise your digital hand if you're inspired and you'd like to join the conversation. We'll certainly do our best to get to everyone. Additionally, to support those using closed captions, please state your name when you begin speaking and then state your name again at the end. So, for example, I would say, my name is Julie and I'm done speaking or something of that nature. Um, please note our club is called Consoli Conversations. Uh, in addition to this room, we host a Data Dignity and a Long COVID Patients Make Researchers room. Um, you can learn more by following the club, Consoli Conversations. You just click the little green pass at the top. Be sure to follow us. You'll get updates, notifications. Um, and now you're able to add any events to your calendar directly, which is a great way to uh, just get things on your calendar and remember later uh, if you're interested in any of those topics. Um, for any direct questions, comments, feedback, suggestions, please message me directly. My email uh, is in my bio. I love hearing from you guys. Uh, if you'd like to join our panel, if you have someone you'd like to recommend, uh, anything at all. Uh, if you'd like to connect with anyone that you've heard from today, I'm happy to make those connections. Uh, please follow us on social media as well. You can find those links in my bio. And for those that don't yet know Consuli, broadly, Consuli is a public benefit company with the mission to enable individuals to participate in the data economy. Experts suggest our individual data is worth approximately 20k per year. Uh, and we help people choose who gets access to and how their personal information is used. And if and when desired, get them paid for their data. And while making medicine better. We do this by operating a marketplace for members where we become their agent. And our members receive smart matched individualized offers from us for opportunities, uh, including participating in clinical trials and data trials. There's no cost to join our movement. You can learn more at consuli.net, that's C-O-N-S-U-L-I.net. Again, you can find that in my bio. Uh, it is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to our co-facilitators Michael Young uh, and Heather Williams uh, who will introduce themselves and our expert guest. Michael, over to you. This is Julie and I'm good speaking. Okay, thank you Julie and uh, Arka for organizing here. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to welcome um, all of you who have joined, uh, especially those of you who are not quite familiar with Clinical Trials Clubhouse. Um, this form has been developed largely for uh, patients and for those who are clinical trialists. Uh, we, we welcome you. We um, do a bit of a nationwide um, canvas to look for um, each month uh, a one burning question. And, um, you know, uh, actually Heather's going to, uh, to tell us about that in just a moment here, but I want to encourage everybody to, from your own discipline, please bring your best opinions in here. Um, I want to credit uh, Joe Kim. Joe, thanks for joining today, because uh, Joe, you were the, the one who um, uh, initially brought this uh, today's one burning question to, to light. And we have just an amazing group of people together here today. Uh, many of you who are in the audience, uh, I'm sure may have things to, uh, to add, so don't hesitate to um, uh, flag our administrators and uh, let's get you up on stage as well. But we have an outstanding um, uh, initial panel here to get started with. And so uh, I wanna take the opportunity to give uh, uh, them to introduce each other um, or introduce themselves. And uh, while 
I'll take it over to Heather here so you can get this going. Thanks, Michael, and thanks, Julie. Uh, I'm always excited to be here for this Clubhouse discussion uh, on clinical trials. There's always such great information and sharing that comes out of it. Uh, for those here, uh, my name is Heather, and my background is on the clinical side in terms of data management and clinical research technology. I work for a company called Trialstat, and I head our project management and operations team, and we provide clinical research services. Um, I, I love to uh, be involved in these conversations, um, so we're going to get to our one burning question really, really shortly. Uh, so thanks, Erica, and everyone else for inviting me to co co -parate. So uh, we're going to open up the one burning question soon, but before we do that, let's get into uh, those on the stage and have everybody do a quick, uh, since we have a lot, a quick 30-second introduction. Um, let's start with, um, who's in our list here? Uh, let's start with Christine, and then we'll go through everybody else. Hi, Christine Von Reisfeld here. I'm CEO and of people with empathy. I'm also a patient advocate. I've participated in studies and some trials on my own and uh, and really just am looking to change the face of clinical trials for patients. Wonderful. I forgot we have two Christines. I should use your last name. Oh, <laughs> it's Heather speaking here. Yo, that was great. Thank you, Christine. And Christine Naro, can you jump in as well? Next. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. My name is Christine Morrow. My background is in clinical research. I have experience at the site level, and I'm currently working for a medical device company as a clinical research associate. I'm also a brand ambassador for Latinos in clinical research. Thank you for having me, and I'm done speaking. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, so let's go with uh, Joe next, please. If you're available, or maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll go with uh, Taya first. Hello, thank you, Heather, for having me. I have uh, been in the clinical research world for over 17 years, and I work now on the IT side. So I'm uh, helping create solutions uh, for the the project teams, and I look forward to this discussion. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Edie, I skipped you earlier. Maybe you can go next. Happy to. This is Edie Edens, and I am a licensed attorney by trade with a really deep expertise in international law and research and ethics and compliance. And I am now consulting with First Class Solutions, as well as doing some teaching of our next generation of health law students. And love being here for these talks as often as I can make it. Thanks so much. I'm Edie at this speaking. Thanks, Edie. Uh, Sophie, can you go next, please? Hi, thanks, Heather. And thank you, Julie, for, for bringing me up here. I'm really interested in this conversation. Hi, my name is Sophie O'Hannon. I'm a clinical evaluation scientist at a medical device company called Boston Scientific. I have been in clinical research for the past 18 years at the site level, the sponsor level, regulatory, um, CRC, CRA, and now I'm a scientist evaluating safety and performance of our devices for EUMDR, continued um, EU approval, and I'm passionate about the rights and ethics as well as access for patients. So this one burning question is, is, is the best one yet. Thanks, Heather. Fantastic. I agree. It's a great question. Uh, David Ostro, would you be able to jump in and introduce yourself, please? Hello. Um, can you hear me? We can. Okay. My name is David Ostro. Um, I'm a senior um, medical scientist who started out doing neuropsychopharmacology research, including clinical trials, then moved into infectious diseases, HIV, AIDS, etc. Um, I was the PI for the hepatitis B vaccine trials, original ones, and uh, for the last 40 years I've been uh, founding PI and then in charge of uh, behavioral studies in a long-term longitudinal study of about 7,000 men um, multi-site um, who are at risk for or surrogated uh, to HIV positive during the study. Um, that, that, in that study, if you're uh, keeping retention of men in the study and keeping the uh, population um, representative of the persons who, um, who are still at risk or most in need of um, 
and also it helps me uh, track where how I'm doing, where I'm doing, and it's I use it as an inspiration to go for my daily walks or to exercise or to take care of my health and eat well. So it's um, so not only as a as a researcher, but even just as a patient. Um, what I really liked is the way they are uh, also last year they for the first time they offered genetic um, genetic testing. So they uh, had a separate informed consent for me and said, "Hey, would you like to get your genome profile?" Uh, you know, and so I signed up for it. And um, uh, after that, they offered a meeting with a genetic counselor and if I have any questions. So I, I really feel that. Um, uh, we do not appreciate enough how much the patients want to be involved in seeing the results, want to be involved in, in that dialogue with the site, whether they are in a critical tri trial setting or whether they are in a standard of care setting. Um, they do want to be involved. And, and, and so the desire is there. I think what is an industry we lack is sometimes uh, uh, not having the processes in place or the tools in place to answer those questions for them, to engage with them appropriately, and then um, along the entire continuum. So we engage with them very well up to informed consent, but then do a bad job along the rest of the trial or along the rest of the care continuum to take care of them. So we need to do a little bit better there. Um, uh, I, I really feel those are some of the areas where some of the low-hanging fruits and we have to communicate the outcome. I think FDA should make it mandatory for anyone who has registered a clinical trial with them on clinicaltrials.gov. We have to communicate the outcome in layman's language to the patient and get a high-level result of the outcome to them. Uh, I, I, that's another change I would like to see from a regulatory perspective as well. Um, once again, this is just high-level initial thoughts. I'm done speaking and I'll pause now. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Arcana. It's Heather here. Uh, I love the points that you brought up and also that you know it's so important for patients to know how to even ask this question, get the conversation started to be able to get access to the information. Um, maybe we can uh, go back to Christine. Uh, so thanks for joining us for that, Arcana. Um, and maybe Christine, uh, Rachel, you can jump in now. Sure. Thanks, uh, it's really quickly. It's virtual. Yeah. Thank you. Let's say one more thing or no? No, I just wanted to correct the pronunciation of the name. Thank you so much. Oh, <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm done speaking now. Thank you. Uh, so this is Christine. Um, oh gosh, where do I start? There are so many points on this that I wanted to, to touch on, but I think the first thing is is one that we always talk about is the education. You know, um, I just presented this morning at a World Drug Safety Conference out of Europe. Unfortunately, not from Europe, but from home. And and we've been discovering. You know, patients don't even know what they're supposed to report. There's all these different things that go into it, and, and the education really is lacking. And I think, you know, we do have all of these studies coming out. I'm part of the All of Us Research Program. I'm part of Stanford's Human Life Program. And, and we're giving up data, which, again, you know, this is the consoli room, so we have those discussions around data as well. So, uh, you know, I think it's really the education. It's really connecting with those patient communities and finding out what they want. We're headed into a digital age and the data is going to become king. So I think we're really coming across a time where it's going to be flipped on its head and really need to educate the patients on what their data is worth, what they need, what's important for them to live. And as part of like the Stanford Human Wine program, there were a lot of things that I monitored that I probably didn't have to that really caused me undue stress. So I think we need to consider all of those things as well. But I think bottom line is education and then really involving the patient communities in the process and again reframing those trials so it's not a last ditch option so they don't feel like you know they're being forced into a clinical trial that this is more of a choice but um yeah i could go on and on but i'm gonna leave it to everyone else at this point <laughs> this I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to uh, step in here and uh, say that I endorse everything Christine said. In fact, I go one step further. It's not just education of the community, it's their education of the researchers before the trial is even planned and, and instituted. Um, find out what are their uh, needs in terms of uh, clinical trial um, results and, and uh, 
any research project uh, aimed at increasing their uh, their access to health care and their um, and the quality and safety of that health care. I, I work in prevention uh, as well as uh, the therapeutics development, and um, uh, so much of the research that's done doesn't actually um, involve, the, involve the patients and it's designed to make sure it's applicable to them. So all of my research is mixed methods. We start out first um, doing ethnographic and, and um, open-ended um, uh, uh, groups uh, uh, discussion to find out what are the pressing issues around our skills and our and our own abilities and um, and then uh, at, at the time that there's a uh, uh, research uh, uh, advisory committee set up there's also a um, both a community advisory committee and once we once we have uh, actually recruited participants to the study um, there is a um, an advisory board uh, made up of the um, uh, representatives of, of the actual participants because I'm talking about very long-term studies the uh, max study which I started in 1983 is still ongoing and collecting data every six uh, months but along the lines we had to uh, re-recruit uh, some populations because uh, as, as the disease changed and, and it's um, uh, trajectories and, and populations. Um, we want to be sure that our that our study um, uh, subject cost of population was representative of the of the current uh, situation. And uh, every time a new uh, issue comes up, there are always ethical and privacy considerations that require us to go back to those those same advisory committees and, and have their input into, into any decisions that are made. Um, and, and again, finally, adherence is, is of utmost importance. Once people have been in a study for 40 years, we don't want to lose them. Their data is very valuable. Um, so uh, we're very considerate of both of their of the burden of time and effort uh, for them to participate. We don't add new questions without very carefully considering what we can take out of the study questionnaire. And um, uh, we will be, I guess, moving into much more uh, telemedicine type of um, interviewing um, uh, as that becomes more established and, and uh, taken up by the uh, research uh, community. So that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, I'll jump in. This is Joe. Um, I'll give sort of two simple reasons why we need to be thinking about this. Um, in, in addition to all the other things folks have said so far and probably will say, in any transaction in the real world, you get a receipt of what you bought. T take a service industry that I think you know, people could moan about, like the airlines. Even then, you get a receipt. Here's what happens, here's what you bought. Go to your car garage, right, where you get your oil changes. Here's what happens. So on some level, it's, this is just what should be done. Forget about all the good, good reasons. Like, you get a receipt whenever something happens. It's the way things work. So that's, you know, probably the easiest reason to sort of say we should be doing this. I'll give a second reason and a sort of a hypothetical story. Let's say my son, is in trial and he's, uh, he suffers from asthma. And we've been failing on you know, current medications. We find a clinical research um, and wow, all of a sudden, whatever we're taking, drug A, uh, works really well. Uh, but the trial ends and we get it. You know, it's not approved yet, so we have to go back to our inferior treatment. And then, I don't know, three, five years later, the drug gets approved, it's marketed. I have no idea what my son took and that he could respond really well. So I'll continue to keep taking inferior medicines because I don't have a sense of how he did on his 
And lo and behold, my son's asthma gets worse and he's got diarrhea and rash because we already took it. I could have had that AE list and the dosage and you know the treatment assignment. So for those two simple reasons alone, I think this is a, a, a no-brainer. That's all I have to say. Joe, um, this is Michael, and I, I just want to amplify what you've said here because if you think about it, um, the analogies that you gave for you know the simple transactions that we encounter on a daily basis, um, clearly, you know, engagement in uh, a clinical trial is a much more personal and much more important um, level of information sharing that that should be there. And uh, the one point I wanted to, to to add to this was to simply recognize that we often way too often hear the story about how patients are feel that they are being treated as quote unquote guinea pigs or subjects or a number. And um, clearly um, understanding the uh, what is going on with you, what data has been generated, and, and having a line of sight into um, really your overall care is a way of uh, personalizing or humanizing that experience. So I really appreciate the, the, the view that you, you've got on this, Joe, and really, and again, thanks so much for surfacing this question. Okay, now I'm compelled to speak. I was really moved by what you said, Joe, but the way, Michael, you phrased it, now I, I absolutely cannot keep quiet. I have hated the word subject for so many years and been trying to get people to switch over to patient. They're still patients, whether they're in a clinical trial or they're getting standard of care or anything. They're still patients. They're still people. They're still human beings, somebody's grandfather, somebody's son, somebody's daughter, sister. So that's one thing. Second of all, Joe, what you said about, you know, getting a receipt, I mean, even for the less sensitive things, like Michael said, you know, we're getting a receipt in exchange for the money that we pay, you know, for that service. But here, this, it's much more precious than money. We are giving of ourselves. We are giving of our bodies. We're giving of our time. Patients are giving of, um, they're, they're giving their trust. They're, they're putting their trust in the hands of caregivers, of doctors and nurses and techs and researchers. Um, so that's a much more precious gift. And yeah, yes, they should definitely get that receipt back, which is, you know, like you said, the data. What's happening with me in this trial? What did you learn? What did we learn? And what can I take with me coming out of this trial? So having said that, I also want to play devil's advocate a little bit, and I want to raise a question, which is, let's think about bias also, and when we try to provide data back, the receipt back to patients, which they deserve and they should have access, let's make sure we, we don't break a bias or a blind or you know something that's going to change the way they respond within the clinical trial, right? Because a lot of our clinical trials are single-blind or double-blind trials where not even the physician knows which the patient is getting the, the drug or the, or the device or the placebo. So in those cases, I think the timing of the data, when we provide that data back to the patient is really critical so that we're not changing their response or their impression of the, of the drug or the investigational product that they're receiving at the time. Um, so how do we do that? Here's my one burning question point five for you. How do we do that? This is Sophie, I'm complete. Can I comment really quick on, on the discussion around the data? Just, I think we're all talking about giving the data back to the patients, but I, I think we don't really get it that most patients don't know what to do with this data. And for me, I'm more interested in those digital rights to my data because I'm not going to do anything. I've been to doctors. I have doctors who are friends who tell me that they have patients that come to them with pages of information that they can't read. And so what I really want to know is where my data is going and how it's being used because I know that it's being sold to third parties in some instances and given to other places. And I think Henrietta Lacks, her family just filed a lawsuit um, around uh, with all of these institutions who used her data and who used her cells. 
So I think it's going to be an interesting discussion as we move forward that it's not just the data that the patients want back. There's really not much that they can do with some of this data, but it is that, that you know, that digital rights to that data that's really needed. And that's uh, my perspective. Can I respond to that specific uh, uh, comment? Because um, the, the um, well, in a, a multi-site study especially, by the time it's been through all the different levels of review and, and, and every participating uh, institution, clinic, and um, and the um, uh, and, and the triple ethics and human subject protection, the uh, consent form is usually quite lengthy. And um, as hard as we try to put it all into uh, a common level of uh, education and, and, and reading, uh, we still uh, go over it uh, in person with the patient and ask them if there are any questions. But at that time that they're starting the study, they're, they're, they're bombarded with information and, and instructions, how to participate, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and they're not going to necessarily remember everything, even if we give them um, a printed copy of the uh, consent form. So I agree, it's very important to periodically uh, review with uh, the participants what um, types of data uh, uh, that we're actively looking at and why and how it's being used. And for that purpose, we have uh, like a newsletter that goes out to all participants so we can uh, inform them ahead of their visit as to what is going to go on at that next visit. And, um, and, 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 and they, they then can prepare or ask questions uh, prior to or at that visit about the data. Dr. Arthur, I love that. I love what you just said about giving them that chance. I'm sorry, Michael, if I cut you off. I just wanted to respond to Dr. Astra. No, that's quite all right, Sophie. I, I just um, think that David has brought up an interesting point, and one of the points of um, on the Clinical Trials Clubhouse is to try and get some, some practical learnings out of this. Um, I'm kind of curious, and I will engage Edie on this as well. Um, is the consent, whether that's an e-consent or a written consent, is that an appropriate place for us to outline what data will be shared back with the patient? Um, is this a place where we could begin that kind of uh, reciprocal um, conversation? Um, Edie, any thoughts? Oh, so many, so many, Michael. So this is Edie. Uh, so, so specific to your question, um, you know, the first and foremost thing, and anyone who has worked with a really meaningful IRB or education in the ethics review and committee space knows that we who are in the compliance space and believe strongly in the power of consent um, you know, we are going to tell you time and time again that consent is not just a document, right? And it's not just a one-time conversation. It's something that should be happening in a very continuing capacity throughout the life of the trial and possibly even after the trial has concluded with those individuals who are part of your trial. Um, and so, you know, from that perspective, I actually love what you were saying, David, about a newsletter. And I was sitting here, and you said with Michael, this is exactly what I was sitting here thinking, which is, so I'm the practical rubber meets the road compliance ops person, right? And you've come to me and you're either going to be a site, you're going to be an institutional review board, you're going to be a research team, um, possibly, although not quite as often, a sponsor who is trying to decide whether or not you want to move forward with what we're discussing, right, in terms of the data rights of the patients participating in the trials as well as them being notified. Uh, in due course of their own personal results. And I was thinking, for me, from an ethics perspective, it's such a foregone conclusion that we should be doing this, that instead of making the argument for, which many of you have done so eloquently today and brought even new points and arguments to the table that I adore, but for me, it's like, okay, so what's stopping us, right? What is the holdup? And I see it as it, being multifaceted. Um, first and foremost, is who truly, quote unquote, whether we agree with it morally or not, who actually per contract, this part where my little lawyer head comes up, owns said data, right? And that's something you have to look to each and every organization in their contractual and transactional setup. But it often will come down to a sponsor decision as to whether or not they're going to release that data to the researchers if it's not investigator initiated. 
um, is really difficult. So it may be even that we think outside the lines of using just consent for this particular topic. Um, if that's what the lawyers want us to, you know, drop the I's and cross the T's, understood. But it may be that we need to even go beyond the confines of just the informed consent document, given it's gotten so muddied with really mission and scope creep. This is easy. I'm done speaking. Uh, can I add to that? that uh, you're absolutely right, and um, we have to th we have to think about consent not as a single event as part of the initiation of, of the participation in the protocol, but as a process. And the, and, and the uh, questions that the patients are going to have will evolve over time. One in particular is: Will I be able to afford and, and get the medicine if the result of this trial shows that it is superior and safer? than the medication for my condition as it is. And um, uh, it's very hard to, uh, to answer that question, especially if you're doing a, if you're contracting with a much larger pharmaceutical company or, or a clinical uh, uh, trial management company. Um, they don't know what, what, what it's gonna cost or whatever um, until, it's, uh, until it's actually approved and so forth. But uh, the, uh, the people these days get into trials because that's their way to get access to medications, which they otherwise cannot have access to. And thank you, and that's a tape it up. So. Um, yes, and I agree, David. It is a way for patients to get into trials um, for medications they cannot afford, especially in the U.S. Uh, coming, though, from the side of, of the sponsor and the pharma, one thing that is important to pharma is to own that data. And the reason is there's a big push on real life um, trials. Sometimes they'll go through that data for reasons um, that aren't really related to this trial, but there'll be another trial later on and they'll, they'll pull that data for another reason, right? So the, the pharma company I don't see them giving up the rights to this data because it is very valuable in the future. If they're not going to use it, the data you have now, they may use it in the future on another study, or they may use it in the planning of another study. So that, that data is very valuable to them. I do understand the perspective of the patient, and I very much relate to what Joe said about his son and needing that data. But Again, you know, it, it, the science, we can't unblind. So like Sophie had mentioned, when do we release this information? That's the most important part. That would be the key. And I agree with Christine that sometimes the patient gets the info and they don't really even understand what they have. And we're seeing this now with the new um, patient rights that we have in the U.S., you know, your uh, blood draw information is automatically sent to you. Sometimes it'll say something like, cannot rule out cancer. Well, that puts the patient in a terrible frame of mind because they haven't even spoke to their doctor yet, and it says this right across their blood results. So we don't want to burden the patient with something that is just, that, I mean, that's a standard language that would come on blood results, right? They would need the doctor to interpret that. So I'm kind of in between, I think, you know, the patients definitely have rights to see their data. Um, the pharma companies really do, in a way, need to own a part of that data. And, um, you know, doctors need to be able to explain to patients what they're seeing in the data. Um, I'm done speaking. Thank you. So two quick responses to that. I think uh, unblinding is, is definitely a, something we want to avoid. The easy answer is when the study is finished, right? So, you know, give data back freely in an ongoing streaming basis. Wait till the analysis is done, and then give it better late than ever, I say. Um, in terms of um, uh, the, the ability to comprehend, I think we have to be careful about being too paternalistic about data return. Everyone look at their cell phone bill. You, do you understand that one? <laughs> I certainly don't, but we get it anyway, right? The point is, is to be as transparent as possible. Of course, there should be a medical intermediary uh, to, to make sense of that data for the most part. I think most data in healthcare is, is treated that way, although in some cases I get lab results um, you know, at the same time that my doctor does. So there are some exceptions, but um, certainly there, there, should, there can be a, a medical interpretation of that. We should just be giving 
uh, data willy-nilly. But I, I wouldn't be too paternalistic either. Can I step in really quick? I agree with you everything on that, but I wanted to go back really quick to the consent because I know we've had this discussion at length of really breaking that up and everything and, and other ways to do it. But I wanted to mention too, again, the education, knowing people knowing about clinical trials ahead of time. We're asking them to sign a consent form at the worst moment of their life when we're basically telling them that you have no other option. And what we really need to do is start offering those clinical trials earlier, offer them as a trial, as a treatment, if that's their choice, you know, and I think it really just needs to go back to informing patients, but having them empowered with the data, not looking at it in different ways, but again, we don't even educate people on what clinical trials are. Most of the U.S. didn't even know what they were until COVID hit, so really, again, going back to that education and that consent, we all think we're protecting ourselves when we're reading that. But as a patient, when I sign those consent forms, I sign them only because that's my last chance. So something to think about. And I'm Christine, my perspective. Yeah, I think that's an important component, but let's use data return as a way to educate. So imagine, you know, a conversation between two friends, one of whom just finished their participation in research. You know, and the other one says, hey, Christine, how was your how was your experience? And you're going to say, great, the study coordinator was so friendly. I never had to wait. I even got, you know, parked and paid for. Uh, and then the next question is probably going to be something like, well, what were you taking? And then you have to sit there and say, I have no idea. And, of course, your friend's going to be like, sign me up. I mean, of course not, right? First is a different conversation where it says, Christine, blah, 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 the study coordinator was great. What were you taking? Oh, I was on a drug A. This is what it's called. Here are my AEs. Here's how my vitals look. Like, so it looks like I responded. My, it was pretty safe for me personally. I can't wait to see when it might come out or when it might file. That's an educational conversation that will, will have a much greater impact than any PR firm, than any pharma company, that any hospital can do. I agree in some ways but in other ways i feel like this is going to create another burden on a system that's already um we're so stretched thin and you know i mean you may be out of a clinical trial and you may think it's over but it's not for us in the back end um just about you know sometimes he's gone for years or they roll over into sister studies and then you know we really couldn't really sit out at that point either so Realistically, we have to look at it when we are able to release data, is that even at a time that would be useful for the patient? It, it, it may not even be meaningful to you at that point. I'm going to echo what Taya said and, uh, from the clinical trial professional perspective. Also from the healthcare perspective, I'm sure you've all heard about physician burnout. Um, nurse burnout, I tech for everyone. So in order for us to provide meaningful information to patients who are participating or volunteering their time to clinical trials um, and provide them a summary that's meaningful for them that they can take forward and well interpreted, um, not just a bunch of data like Christine said, it has to be an all-inclusive package. It, it, you know, we shouldn't just be dumping a bunch of data on them. They have to have someone to, to go to to interpret, to have that conversation. So it has to be delicately done, I think. It, it's a very good idea to do it, but I think the timing is very important and making sure that that patient is fully supported on all sides and they're ha they have an all-inclusive data package that they can actually understand and take forward with them in a meaningful way. This is Sophie. I'm complete. Uh, a very practical aspect of what uh, you were just saying, Sophie, is this whole issue of um, patients being rolled over from one study to another one that is conceived in part on based on the results of, of the initial study. Uh, what we very often do in that case is we have a separate consent that asks the patient um, whether or not they want to be contacted and, and told about uh, subsequent studies that might be of 
it's relevant to, to their illness or the, their condition. And um, we do that usually as part of where we ask them how do they want to be contacted and in what form, because the privacy and information is very important. Um, and um, we can't control what the patient does with that data if they have them, but we can certainly can make sure that it's given to them in a form that uh, they can understand and they don't have to um, go to their friends necessarily and tell them all about their vital signs and, and biomarkers and so forth in order to get help in understanding it. And um, I guess that's it for them. I've actually had studies where it was in the informed consent that the patient could not speak about the trial on especially social media because of uh, the fear of spreading, um, you know, distrust in clinical research or in the company. I also want to point out too, I, I know that some of you are aware of it, but the company Syscript also, they use patient reviewers to look at the drugs, you know, to look at these, these um, things that they send back to patients after the trial is done that really tells them what the, the purpose of the trial was, what their data showed them, and, and all of the results in an easy-to-read way that is then vetted by patients. So I think it's, you know, it is there, I think, that there is a need, and I think that that's growing. Patients are going to demand that um, coming forward. So that's my perspective. I want to respond to what he said. Um, uh, putting in the consent form a, um, a writer forbidding them from discussing the trial on social media in today's climate could be seen as part of the conspiracy to keep patients from knowing what is being done to them and uh, by, by healthcare science or whatever. So it can backfire. Um, but what I think is really important is in the, in the consent process and education that here's what we do to protect your data but um uh there there are ways that you can control um the uh confidentiality once you have that data and 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 one of them is to um be you know be think before you uh, uh discuss your your uh, participation and results um in a forum like social media where anybody can um can, can get a hold of it. I mean, I do survey research a lot, and, and there we always um, uh, are concerned if we're trying to find a hard to reach or, or relatively rare population um, through various um, screening methods and, and so forth. Um, we have to do calculations in advance that, that, that be sure that when a public data set is produced, there aren't so few people in a particular um, geographical area that others can uh, indirectly infer the identity of the patient from their age, race, um, etc. Um, and that should actually become a specialized form of statistical analysis um, in the planning of studies. Thanks, David. <laughs> I appreciate that view. I'm Kind of curious, uh, Christine Naro, um, you know, from your perspective, both from your military experience as well as um, the work that you, the great work that you've been doing in the Latinx population, are there um, aspects of, you know, cultural norms that need to be brought into this discussion? Thank you, Michael. Um, this is Christine speaking. So I think that there are cultural norms, for example, like a lot of times in the Latino community, for patients that only speak Spanish, their family members will step in a lot for them, so um, providing them access as well. And when I was invited to this conversation, I thought of it in a more simplistic way, because the questions that I would get when I was consenting patients were more along the lines of how many patients were in the trial, you know, let's say phase one, two, or three, if it was four, and stuff like that. So they want to know more about how the numbers and, like, you know, if there's been any AEs and stuff like that. So I was thinking more of something like, how when you go to Domino's Pizza, I know this sounds funny, but you have a tracker for your pizza and it tells you when the pizza is ready, right? So for clinical trials, it would be a tracker for phase one, two, three, showing where it's at, how many patients participated, how many AEs there were, and stuff like that. Um, so that's my perspective. Thank you. I'm done speaking. Hey, Michael, can I step in for one second? And just <laughs> point Absolutely. Absolutely. I just want to say, too, like we're talking about giving data back to the patients, and I, I, 
at the amount of data that they collect on me, I don't have the capacity to store that data, let alone sort through all of it. And so what I would really like as a patient is like a, a broker for my data, right? I would like to have my data in a collective pool with other people with my similar conditions and be able to say, I want to use my data in this way. But honestly, the amount of data that is collected, the amount of blood tests, I have hundreds of blood tests in just this year. And to, to store that, to sort through that, that's too much for any patient dealing with a chronic condition. So when we're talking about the data, I think giving it back to them, yeah, it's great. But what are they really going to do with it when they have piles and piles of it? And I think that's where you need to educate a lot of the patient communities more so on the value of that data again. And I'm Christina Dunn. Thanks, Christine. I uh, appreciate that. Um, I think what we'd like to do at this point, it's just about 11.30. Um, I'd like to have uh, Julie reset the room here and uh, make sure that anybody else who has just joined uh, understands what we're focusing on. We'll take uh, one minute to do that and we'll come back to the conversation. Hi, everyone. This is Julie Schmidt, project manager at Consoli and host for this clinical trials room. I certainly hope everyone is enjoying this conversation. I know I am. I just want to take a moment, reset our room, and share a little bit about Consoli's mission. Uh, we are Consoli Conversations. Uh, we're a public benefit company working to create a marketplace where we deal individuals like you and me into the data economy and help make medicine better by smart matching patients with clinical trials that are right for them. We're creating a movement and there's no cost to join. Um, please check us out, sign up. You can find our website, uh, links to our socials, and my direct email in my bio if you have any questions and want to reach out directly. Um, also in this moment, uh, please ping others into the room that may be interested in following along this conversation. Um, uh, by using a little plus sign at the bottom. and. Also, don't forget to follow Consoli Conversations um, and join all of our future rooms. Thanks so much for joining us. Passing the mic back to Heather. This is Julie, and I'm done speaking. Fantastic. Hi, it's Heather here. Um, I wasn't sure. We'd just like to make sure that everyone in the audience feels comfortable and welcome to jump up if you'd like to participate in the conversation uh, before we move on. Towards the uh, end of, uh, of the discussion today, we will be doing a poll for the next month's one burning question. So maybe it's a good time for everyone to think about what you might enjoy uh, for our next discussion uh, in the following month on the same topic. Uh, Michael, I don't know if we wanted to do that now or just wait a little bit longer and chat a little bit more. I'm Heather, I'm Jen speaking. Um, thanks, Heather. I, I think we can wait a few minutes on this. Um, I know that uh, um, some of the folks on, on the panel here have not had a chance to really chime in. Um, Taya, do you have uh, some additional views uh, on this topic? I'd uh, be happy to, uh, to get those uh, into the conversation as well. Sure. I mean, I think I'm more on the, like I mentioned before, sponsor or pharma side of things. So for me, it's all about the science and making sure that that data is protected in a way that can be useful. Um, you know, like I mentioned before with like double blinded studies, we want to make sure that no one is made aware or, you know, that that information is leaked to either party. Even the doctors don't know you know, usually what the patient's on in those. So trying to protect that data and then further down the road, I think it's very valuable uh, to have that da data in, in a way that the pharma companies can access it. Uh, because like I said, they use that to plan other trials. Um, they may use that to show efficacy later on. Uh, they may be just gathering data on... Uh, patients that are likely to have a certain disease. So there's just a million ways that they use that data. So I guess the question I have is, you know, should we be monetizing that then for the patient? Not taking it away from pharma, but giving back to patient. Um, that's where I'm coming from. I guess I think that yes, it's, it's your data. You should have the rights to it, but 
within a reasonable time. Uh, like I mentioned, not to uh, distract or take away from the research. But then also, you should be compensated maybe for that data if it does help create things later on. And, and I like Christine's uh, mention of the HeLa cell issue that's happening right now. Um, it'll be very interesting to see how that turns out. Uh, my name is Kay, and I'm speaking. Thank you. Kay, hey, thank you very much. This is Michael, and I, I, I'd like to explore that a little bit because just the very fact that um, most patients are not aware that uh, the data that they are contributing for an individual trial, um, especially in some sort of a real-world evidence type of scenario, actually might be used for other comparative purposes or, uh, you know, certainly trying to get milestones or level set uh, thinking about additional trials. Um, do you, do, or does the group here feel that that alone is an issue? Um, you know, the fact that there isn't that transparency typically. Um, and number two, uh, if anybody wants to chime in, and I'll, I'll uh, uh, ask Elizabeth also um, to think about uh, a response to this. What, what should be an equitable and um, informed way in which to actually compensate for that information? I will say most informed consents contain a statement about um, future data. Yeah, it's future use. Yeah. It, the, the problem is patients don't read their informed consents or don't understand the informed consents. Um, doctors are very limited on time that they have with the patient. They may not even be in the room when the informed consent is given to them. Uh, it may be a nurse or other clinical staff. And again, they are also um, very restricted on time. So who knows? So I, I, I've been actually seeing a trend where pharma companies are requiring the nurse or clinical staff to record the informed consent process. I don't know if anyone else has seen that, but I have. Um, so it's a known problem, basically. If they're asking you to record it, they know it's a problem. Absolutely. I can tell you in the state of Pennsylvania, not only a physician is allowed to consent a patient. So the final consent signature on the ICF must be a physician, MD or DO. Um, and that came about because of multiple different healthcare professionals consenting a patient, too many hands in the pot, and sometimes the physician was involved, but um, not the, the last point of, of contact for that consent form process. And like David said earlier, it must be a process. So I don't know how exactly we could compensate a patient for their data or how much should be compensated and when, but I think it has to be well thought out, this, the, the provision of this data to the patient and making sure that the patient understands what they're volunteering for and what they're going to be getting back and when has to be all inclusive. It can't just be, you know, a, a digital file that's sent to the patient. There has to be some conversation around it and we have to make sure that the professionals who are providing that guidance or, or that conversation are equipped with the information, with the time, with the resources required to get that done. Or otherwise, we're rushing to do something that we are not prepared for, right? And that's uh, uh, counterproductive. We don't want to be doing that. It's really important to, to look at all angles and make sure that they are getting what they, uh, what they deserve and they understand uh, what they're getting ahead of time. So part of what we do, I mean, I don't know how many people know, there is, like I said, there is a section in the consent, most consent forms, talking about future use of the data. There's also sub-studies within a clinical trial that sometimes patients can sign up for or not sign up for uh, during the, the progress of their trial. And the, this data can be used not only for another, a sister study like Taya said, but also years and decades down the line. I know this because that's what I do. I, I'm looking at a clinical trial right now from 20 years ago um, on a, a device that you know is no longer in use, but we are claiming equivalence to that device right now for EU uh, approval. And so I'm looking at data from you know patients from a couple, before I even got into medical device 
profession. Um, and that is, it's not, uh, it's not exclusive to medical device. It's not exclusive to, to pharma. It's happening all the time. So that has to be made clear. And the patients really have to understand what they're doing and what they deserve back and what they're getting back and the interpretation of that before we just start providing that. I think that's super, super important. Can't say it enough. I'm so free. I'm complete. Sophie, it's Michael, and those, those are excellent points. I, I, I agree, you know, especially in your situation where you've got a predicate device that you're looking at data uh, being generated to get that approval, but it was 20 years ago. Um, you know, I, I, this is a complex problem here because the data is the data and it stays in there and it's, um, you know, essentially forever accessible. Um, uh, Lisa, uh, you have to come to the, to the stage here, so I'd love to give you a little time to talk. Yeah, hi, I'm Lisa, so uh, just to introduce myself really quickly, I um, have a background in uh, clinical research. I'm a nurse by training. Um, I have worked in clinical research for about 16 years as a site-site coordinator, uh, moved through administration, and then moved to work for a and recently with Big Pharma. And I've also been a research clinical research participant as well as had my children participate in clinical research. But um, a couple of times, I love this topic, I love this room, and, and this is a it's quite, you know, great interest to me, and there, I think the lawyer left the room, but there is case law, um, I can start telling you the, uh, the uh, reference that I have, but if you look up more versus regions of University of California, um, there was, uh, and there are, three, there are three separate cases that basically go to show in courts, the Greenberg versus Miami Children's, uh, Washington University versus, versus Catalonia, where when a patient participates in clinical research, and like in the case of Moore versus Regents at the University of California, the cell line, there was a cell line developed from a patient who had hairy cell leukemia um, by, I think, Dr. Goldberg or Goldman at the University of California, the University of California, and they profited from that cell line that was developed from a patient, right? And so the court in that case um, favored the University of California because at that point those cells were, uh, you know, derived as part of the patient's research. But at the time, there wasn't any, um, they didn't think to look for that until later, right? And then if you go on to those other cases too, they're just, they, the court has, you know, stated and, and upheld those prior um, cases where you basically don't have any property rights to the tissue that you've donated to research. Um, and I think the last case was a very big case because I think there were over 30,000 prostate uh, cancer samples um, that this physician wanted to take with him from the University of Washington. He wasn't able to because it was part of this bigger tissue bank. And so I think those are things that you know, maybe changing with the law. And when I looked into this a long time ago, I don't, I think that those are still upheld. Um, and, he, you know, I got interested in this because of the Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks um, story. And it was interesting because, you know, there was no law at the time, but then thereafter, you know, the courts have favored that, you know, the tissue that you donate and things like that aren't, aren't yours once they're part of the study. And so I think we do need to be clear with patients. Um, and I think that's where we, you know, added to the consent forms when we're doing these trials, you know, future research and what does that mean? And I do think it, the onus shouldn't be on the patient. It should be on pharma. I think that, you know, I don't, I'm not for sure. I, I don't agree with paying patients for their data per se in regards, because they do get stipends and we want to be careful of coercion. Um, but I, you know, I do think that it, you know, we put in our consent forms. If you want the data, we end up putting that onus on the patient to ask for it. And I don't think that's fair. I think that we should provide that data to the patient in whatever format that they want, uh, whether it's digital, whether it's we print out the entire ECRM case report forms. But we need to do what we say. We need to be transparent. We need to be trustful in the industry. So if we say we're going to provide you. Um, and I know at least for my company, you know, we have a website for our trials and we will post the clinical trial summary in a patient summary in a layman's language so that they can go to that website and see, you know, what their participation meant in, a, in an aggregate way, right? Here's the trial results and it's in a way that you can understand it and read it because what will typically happen 
than what we're seeing today, which is insane, is the preprints and, you know, Pfizer and Moderna posting things out and press releases before they even go to the FDA. And so it's a weird world that we live in now, but I don't think, um, you know, the common layperson understands what those trial results mean. So we need to be better about our health literacy and really, and I think we need to put that onus on pharmaceutical companies, not on the patients, because if we say we're grateful and we're thankful for all that you've provided and you've participated in our trial, and we really need to show that. And, and that means having patient advocates and listening to the patient and have them be on our boards and, you know, um, go to them first and say, how should a trial be designed? What would work for you? Because, um, you know, we just kind of create these trials and, and don't think about logistics, regionality, access. Um, and then that means a whole subset of patients aren't being met, right? So I do love where we're going. Uh, so, so many topics I've really been excited about this room and glad you let me up here. But, like, I love where we're going with decentralized clinical trials so that we can, want to improve access, increase diversity. But then again, um, I really do think we need to go back and, and push pharma to be better. I have a question. Sorry, Michael. I had a question for Lisa. Uh, Lisa, who does the web maintenance and who? makes the statement in layman's terms at your site? Um, so it's not my site, my actual, it's actually my company. So my company creates the website and they have um, that, you know, marketing and people put together, you know, what we call the trial summary for the patients. Um, I, I would uh, mention that sometimes the marketing interests are not necessarily lined up with the participants' interests. And, um, for example, I got invited to apply for a job. I will mention the company, very large pharmaceutical company, for the position of vice president for patient access. So I thought I would look at it because that's a very, very high priority aspect, uh, as I mentioned before. And the first line of the responsibilities of this position were not to the patients, but to increase the net revenue of the company. So I wrote to the HR director and I said, well, which is it? Is this patient advocacy or is this marketing? And um, they kind of, you know, couldn't really answer that question. Uh, what, what they said was, well, you, you need to talk that, you need to escalate that conversation to a higher level. But they wouldn't tell me just who I'm at the company I should talk to about that. Um, and, and of course, my other pet peeve is direct to consumer advertising of approved drugs um, on, on television because we talk about you know, doing things in a way that the patients are informed, but all the side effects are uh, rushed through at the end of the advertisement. Uh, it, you know, so fast that um, even if you, you're looking for it, uh, you're very likely not to uh, uh, hear or understand what's, what's being said. And we have to be very careful that we're, we're not um, uh, using that as a model for our communication. Thank you, David. I, I think that uh, those are several good points here. Christine, just uh, hang one quick second here. Um, I'd like to make sure. Um, Joe, if you're still on uh, and able to uh, to respond, I kind of, given your your role at Eli Lilly uh, and uh, you know your great view of what the industry is doing, when, where do you fall on some of this? Uh, well, I can't say it better than Lisa said it. Uh, so I guess what I can add to the conversation is uh, the, the way I introduced this question last time was. I'm not sure what people will think of me, but if nothing else, I have a string of failures in my past. And one of these failures was my inability to motivate others uh, and the industry to do this systematically as a, as a standard business practice. Um, so that, that's where I am. I, I have some scars from doing it uh, or from try, attempting it, uh, but it's not something I'll give up, uh, though I may be taking a break from it now, but clearly I'm still passionate about it. Absolutely. We understand that, too. I, um, I, I share some of the same uh, lacerations here. Um, uh, Christine? Michael? Uh, with oh, the okay. Yes. Hi. Would it be okay just to say a few words here? Sure. Absolutely. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, really appreciate the conversation. Um, I want to introduce uh, sort of a much bigger frame here for us, and that's the context of you know, what's the most dignified thing we could be designing 
in the context of, you know, thinking about this as human rights. Um, we've heard, you know, about ownership, and I think the language thing I'm starting to become more acquainted with is maybe licensing as opposed to ownership, but nevertheless, the property rights, I think, or quasi-property rights, as some legal scholars are sort of talking about. But, you know, clearly, if I were to look at, at first principles, you know, in a human rights context, uh, what comes forward, you know, pretty vigorously as we look across the world is this idea of, you know, what's, what's the right structure for this in the context of human rights? So ownership, transparency, and legitimate consent, all of those pieces, there have been different parts of this conversation that have touched on. Um, and I won't, you know, dive into those, but I will just say, like, if we take a bigger view and say, what, you know, separate from, of course, we all need this data. It's part of human understanding. It's part of what allows us to move forward as a species. And, you know, how do we dignify individuals in this process? Um, interestingly enough, uh, in the United States and in Europe and other places in the world, uh, we've gotten tripped up in privacy as opposed to really thinking about these issues from more of a human rights perspective. So an area that we're exploring is, you know, codifying those three elements, ownership or quasi-ownership in the context of licensing, transparency and legitimate consent in the form of a Data Dignity Act, something that I think has um, importance and for those that are interested, we I welcome that. Feel free to, to follow me or ping me on my, my information's in my bio. And then also, you know, really, if we think about dignity, you know, at some sort of a data dignity alliance. So those are two pieces I just want to bring on the, on the table here. And um, this is Elizabeth, and I'm done speaking. Elizabeth, thanks very much. I think it's also worth noting that those of you who do have um, an abiding interest in uh, the handling of this kind of data and where we might go with this overall um, larger uh, construct. Uh, uh, Kasuli does, uh, the Kasuli Conversations uh, portfolio also does include um, a specific room uh, approaching, I mean, uh, discussing data dignity. Um, we're closing in on uh, about an hour and a half here, so I want to try and throw this open to any final comments. Um, and uh, then uh, certainly uh, look forward to giving you some information about our next meeting. Um, Christine, you were, you've been patient. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. Um, first, I want to say one of the terms that I'm hearing a lot more too is agency and giving patients the agency, right? And so I, I just wanted to say I think we're not looking far enough into the future with genetic sequencing and everything that's happening in the world, um, we're still looking at this as a healthcare issue. And I think we need to look past pharma and look at a, the bigger picture on a global level. And I actually, Alice Rathjen has been a guest on the Data Dignity calls with you guys. And I'm doing a Zoom tomorrow and it's Alice speaking with uh, Richard Dasher, who is a health economist from Stanford. And uh, we've got a woman from pharma, we've got me, That she's going to discuss tomorrow as well. So I don't know. I think we are kind of stuck in this in this past version of everything that we're working on, and we really need to look at what's out there in the future. And my perspective. Thanks, Christine. And in fact, uh, if, yeah, go ahead, Joe. Just, just one document here. Um, if you Google MRCT, individual data return, there's actually some formalized thinking on this. Uh, beyond just kind of what we've been talking about. Uh, again, it's MRCT, Individual Data Return. And this was a consortium run by uh, Harvard and other academics and uh, pharma and government and uh, patient advocates that have come together to give us a, a much more clear roadmap of how best to do this. Um, so a lot of thinking has been done, both from a bioethical standpoint, operational, uh, when and how, uh, and to whom. So I would urge us all to look at that and see if we can 
kind of make make progress on this idea. Joe, great share. Thank you so much. We've uh, we've definitely made notes here, and uh, I hope everybody else will take take the time to look at this because this uh, obviously is just scraping the the you know really the top of the barrel here for this. And Christine, um, uh, I think it's if you want to put it into the notes here. Um, the, the session you were talking about was for health reconsidered, correct? Yeah, it's tomorrow it's our live Zoom event. So we'll be on I believe it's eight AM Pacific time. It's an hour, but then we'll come we'll be coming to Clubhouse afterwards to have a chat with everybody on on what they thought about the panel discussion. So should be interesting. Great. It's at seven AM or eight AM, Christine. So usually thought... our clubhouse is seven AM, but when we do the live event, I believe it's eight. But let me check again. <laughs> it's on my <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I think you're I think you're correct, Christine. I've signed up for it. It is eight o'clock. Um uh that's my recollection. <laughs> no problem. Hey, are you doing are you taking the questions for next week or suggestions? Yes, please. If you've got one. Yeah. So I was just thinking, how can we reduce the burden of stress on our physicians and the patients and really looking at decentralized trials with uh, incentives for physicians working in local areas and how we can incorporate them? So I don't know how we phrase that into a question, but how do we do that, I guess? That's, that's good. We're taking notes. Thank you. I just had a really quick comment, Michael. Uh, okay, I wanted to say I think that this room has been so wonderful in hearing the different perspectives, but also I just wanted to keep in mind that each one of us comes from a different world, right? I am from the pharma CRO world. There's very high pressure. Uh, we have tight timelines. We don't have uh, additional time. Then we have... Uh, you know, some of the patients coming from the world where they're doing a phase three or phase four trial, they may know exactly what drug they're getting and the blinding issue may not even, you know, resonate with them at all. Then we have, you know, people that come from companies where they're doing a lot of personalized care, like Lisa's company seems like it's doing a wonderful job creating these summaries. But it's not something that you can expect across the board. I just wanted to, to throw that out there because I know from my perspective, we would never have time to be ready summaries. <laughs> so I just I just wanted to say there's there's so much in the research world. There's so many different layers to this. It's um, it's very complicated. But uh, thank you. Yeah, okay. thank you for pointing out the fact that we what we do try to do is have. Um, a really solid mix of opinions and viewpoints so um, so that everybody can hear what's going on. Um, that's the purpose of the Clinical Trials Clubhouse and taking advantage of the technology that's, uh, that's offered us here. Um, Christine Naro, do you have any final comments? Thank you, Michael. Um, my final comment is just to say that um, I'm so proud to be in this room where I'm surrounded by people that care about patients and their data, and I just wanted to say thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. Thank you so much for uh, investing some time and talent into this. Lisa, thoughts? Yeah, thank you so much for the room and the space, and I just wanted to add, you know, when I did look at a physician um, in Big Pharma, I really scoured their social responsibility pages, what were these companies, you know, doing for um, for the greater good, um, you know, at their company and outside their company, um, and so that was a big proponent of why I ended up where I ended up, but I do, just to be devil's advocate a bit with Taya there, we do have a responsibility when we are required to post you know, to clinicaltrials.gov, the trials that are available and the results, right? And I think that the industry has lacked um, and no one's really kind of following up on that, that their results aren't being posted there, right? And I think we need to, you know, you know, it was one great that Congress wanted to create um, a, a national registry for trials, but part of that was to give information to patients um, and once the, once the trial was finished. And so I, I do think that we need to be, you know, better about that, whether it is at an academic institution or wherever your research is being done, that you push back on the sponsor to provide that for you and post it. 
if you're posting it for your institution or sponsors need to post that information. Um, again, it's not in lay, it's not in layman's terms and they're not required to post it in layman's terms per se, but um, that, you know, that's where I think my company is great in, in looking at that and doing that and, and getting that information from patients directly and being an advocate. But you know, we do have that responsibility as an industry and I think we should advocate for that. Thanks. I, yeah, I agree. I think, Michael, that could be a whole room topic on its own, uh, clintrial.gov. Yep, absolutely. Uh, we may come to that too, Dan. Great. Uh, I appreciate any other feedback that uh, that you folks want to want to provide. Um, I'm going to go to Sophie now and uh, ask her for any last thoughts and whether she, I, Sophie, I know I'm going to be talking to you later on this evening, but um, uh, love to hear what your think, thinking is about this today. Thank you, Michael. First of all, thank you for this room. Thank you for this diverse and eclectic crowd because you know, I always say the more diverse the panel, the richer the discussion. And I always want to learn. I'm looking to soak up everything that anyone can tell me. If you can give me a different perspective from what I have, I'm gonna I'm gonna chase you.